I want to invite you to open your Bibles this morning to Deuteronomy chapter 10. As you know, we're in a series, and the title of the series is the God Series. But today is God's requirements. God's requirements. So this might be a little tough today, uh, but if it is, then you talk to God about it because I'm just preaching what He gives me. I'm just saying. But we're talking about God's requirements, and we're going to be reading in Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 through 13. Here's what it says. It says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, and to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and His statutes, which I command you today for your good. It asks this question, what does the Lord your God require of you? And then it answers the question by saying a few things. It says, fear the Lord your God. Walk in all His ways. Love Him. Serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And keep the commandments of the Lord. Keep His statutes, which I command you today. So the question is this. What would it look like to fear, to walk, to love, to serve, and to obey the Lord? What would that look like in your life? Five things that we're going to look at today that will help us to fulfill God's requirements. Now, the first thing that we want to look at is that God wants us to be members of His family. Members of His family. You know, following Christ is not just believing, it's belonging. It's belonging. The Christian faith is not a solo act. We're meant to live in relationship with each other. We're meant to come here and build relationships here. We're meant to encourage one another and strengthen each other as a family. And God's given the church as a spiritual family for our own benefit. And I'll show you some scriptures that, that speak to that. The first one is this. We belong to God's household. In Ephesians 2.19 it says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and, listen, members of the household of God. We belong to God's household. Being members of God's household means that we're a family, does it not? Now I think about a family that went to church and on a particular Sunday, they, they had a newborn and they brought the newborn to church to dedicate that baby. And the little brother was with them and all the way home, he just cried and cried and cried. And his dad asked him two or three times, son, why are you crying? And he had just cried and cried. Finally, he asked him again, son, why are you crying? And, and the boy spoke up. He says, because that minister said that he hoped we'd be brought up in a Christian home and I want to stay with y'all. <laughs> I want to stay with y'all. We belong to God's household. Not only that, but we're called God's children. Listen to Ephesians 5.1. It says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. Listen, your children look like you. They act like you. They pick up your traits. And, and people see your children. They go, oh, I can tell. You're... You know, they'll say, you, your son looks just like you. Your daughter looks just like you. Well, this is what God's saying. Be imitators of God as dear children. We're called God's children. Being God's children makes us what? Brothers and sisters to each other. Because we're all God's children. And not only that, but we see that the church is God's house. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, it says this. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. So here we're being told that we belong to God's household, that we're called God's children, and that the church is God's house. 
Now there's a lesson in that, and here's the lesson, is that God's house is to be managed like a family. We're a living organism, not an organization. We need to make sure that when we're making decisions, you that are leaders in this church, when you're making decisions about the church, that you're making decisions that you making decisions for your family, not for your job. We're a family. 1 Timothy 3, verses 4 and 5, where uh, Paul is giving Timothy the qualifications of a pastor. Listen to what he says. He says, One who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? So right there, Paul is saying, this is a family. It's not a corporation. This is a family and we must respond to each other as children of God, as brothers and sisters, as family members. And listen, when one's hurting, everybody should hurt with them. When one's in need, we should run to their need. When, when one celebrates, we should celebrate with them. We should be the family of God. So God wants us to be members of His family. But not only that, God wants us to be models of His character. You know, God wants every believer to grow up and become like Him. To look like Him. Becoming like Christ is the biblical definition of spiritual maturity. Become, the more you're like Christ, the more spiritually mature that you are. Jesus has established a pattern for us to follow. And the way that that pattern looks is like this. First, we see that we're to act like Jesus. In John 13, 15, it says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Act like me. That's what Jesus is saying. What I've done to you, you should do. But not only that, we're told in Romans 13, 14 that we're to look like Jesus. It says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Put on Jesus. You know what? If you put on Jesus when people see you, what do they see? Jesus. That's right. So we want to put on Jesus. We want to look like Him is what it's teaching us. And not only that, but we're to be the model of Jesus. Paul gives us several specific areas in which we're able to model the character of Christ in 1 Timothy 4.12. Listen to what he says. He says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, and in purity. So how are we to model Jesus? Well, those are some important areas. How do we model Jesus in word? What comes out of our mouth? What would come out of Jesus' mouth? Always gauge what's coming out of your mouth by what you believe would come out of Jesus' mouth. And then it says, in conduct, how would Jesus act? Always gauge your conduct by saying, would Jesus conduct Himself this way? And then it says, in love, we know about the love of Christ. Anyone who's a follower of Christ knows the love of Christ, knows that Christ had laid down His life for you. That's what drew us to Him. That's what drew me to Him is that He gave everything for me. He loved me so much. It, it's mind-blowing and how much He loves us. So how much do we love? How much do we love? And then it says in spirit. And how are you spiritually today? Man, I, I, I read the Gospels and I read the story of Jesus and He was no doubt a spiritual giant. He walked in the Spirit. He lived in the Spirit. He spoke in the Spirit. He prayed in the Spirit. He's given us the example. And He said, now I want you to model this. Be like me. And then it says in faith, how strong is your faith today? How much confidence do you have in the Savior today? How strong is your faith? And finally, in purity. When you look at yourself in the mirror, can you look at yourself and say, I'm, I'm living a life of purity before the Lord. Those are all important things. All important characteristics to 
model who Jesus Christ is. And, and here's what I want you to notice. As we, as we look at those things, we're to act like Jesus, we're to look like Jesus, we're to be a model of Jesus. Know it, notice this. Maturity is not a me measurement of how much one learns. Maturity is a measurement by your lifestyle. How much do you look like Jesus? How much do you model Jesus? How much do you act like Jesus? It's the lifestyle that determines if you're modeling His character. You know, here's what I'm saying to you. It's possible to know this Bible cover to cover. It's possible to be a genius when it comes to speaking about spiritual things. But if your life's not showing it, then what's the use? It's all about the living, not the knowing. Thirdly, God wants us to be ministers of His grace. Every Christian is to personalize service in ministry. You know what it means to personalize something? Make it your own. Make it your own. Make it your service. Make it your ministry. God expects us to use the gifts that He gives us. We're taught in God's Word that when we receive Christ, we also receive the first gift. You know what the first gift is? When we are saved, we're given a gift. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And, and you know, Paul says, don't you know that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit? But then, after we receive the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes into us, you know what the Holy Spirit does? Brings more gifts. If you're a believer today, number one, you've been saved. Number two, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Number three, the Holy Spirit has brought gifts for you to use and to exercise for the glory of God. And so God wants us to be ministers, so He gives us these gifts, these talents, these opportunities, and He expects us to use them and to give them away as the benefit of others. Good stewards of God's grace. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each one has received a gift, each one, and by the way, each one has received a gift. Maybe you haven't identified it. But if you're a believer in Christ today, if you dwell by the Holy Spirit today, you've received at least one gift, if not, if not more. But it says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. In other words, you receive a gift and you're expected to minister out of that giftedness, whatever it is for you. You need to discover what that is. Good stewards of God's grace. Not only that, we're created for good works. That's why God created us. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's pretty plain. We're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Alright, y'all wake up now. That was just a test to see if y'all was awake and you failed. Wake up. Wake up and listen. Create it for good works. And it says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He's created you for good works and you should walk in those good works that God's created you for. And you say, well, how do I know what those good works are? Well, you need to find your calling. You need to find your calling and you need to surrender to it and you need to live in it every day. What is your calling? I think about Miss Mary. She's found her calling literally. Right? Her calling is calling people. And she's faithful to do it. And you're all smiling because you know she's called you. She has, I mean, I don't guess, Miss Mary, anybody come up to you one day and say, will you be the caller of the church? Did anybody do that? You just call. Every week you call. You call me. If I don't answer, she leaves me a message. That's her calling. She found it and she's doing it and she's surrendered to it. I think about uh, Jim over here. Jim... He, he's kind of found his calling and he, he's named it Elmer. 
He made him a button. You know, you may recall uh, a couple months ago, I preached a message and I shared a story of my buddy Elmer, which by the way, I've, I've, I'm working on a video to tell that story, just that part of that message. And I'm putting in pictures that, that back it up. And I'm even including uh, a video of him singing. I told y'all that he sang over everybody. I, I'm even including that. And that should be ready in the next few days. And I'll post it on our, on our Facebook page and you'll get to see that. But I remember after I preached that message, I told that story to my buddy Elmer. Uh, maybe it was the next week, I don't know, but Jim shows up with a button and says, I'm an Elmer. Yeah. I'm an Elmer. And you know, he is a lot like Elmer because he just finds stuff to do and he does it. Y'all seen him on uh, Easter or Mother's Day just set up a camera and take pictures. And listen, I didn't ask him, can I talk about him like this today? So I hope I'm not embarrassing you, but it's just, this is w what's going on. And, and uh, just... You know, they're out at the park Saturday, giving out some water, right? And just finding the things that speak to your heart and doing it. That's how you find your calling. How does God speak to your heart? He says that you've been given a gift, that you've been given a calling, and that you're to walk in it every day. But here's our challenge. Here's our challenge when it comes to finding our calling and walking in it. The challenge is, is that we don't want to give up any time. We don't want to give up ourselves. We don't want to give up any of our lifestyle, any of our realities. You may be so overly qualified for one of these positions and you know it, but you're not willing to give up anything to just do it. And I want to tell you something here is that when it comes to accomplishing ministry in this church and this church growing, guess what? People are going to have to make sacrifices and become a part of the ministry of the church and not just a part of the Sunday morning worship service. God wants us to be ministers of His grace. Not only that, but God wants us to be messengers of His love. God expects each one of us to make evangelism a personal purpose in our life. Telling other people about Jesus. Once we've been born again, we become messengers of the good news of Jesus Christ. Once we've been born again. And here's what I want you to understand. We all have a testimony. We have a testimony. Acts 20, 24 says, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus. Listen to what he says the ministry is. To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. To testify of the gospel. I think about how Christ saved me. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget how He rescued me from my sins. And many times I've shared a testimony to that fact. At some point in your life, the Lord rescued you from your sins. And however He did that, that's your testimony. You know what's the beautiful thing about having a testimony? It's a testimony will hold up in a court of law. I mean, if you share your testimony with somebody, nobody can say you're a liar. Nobody can say that don't count. I mean, that personal witness, that testimony, here's what happened to me. Let me tell you how the Lord saved me. Let me tell you how Christ came into my heart and how my life has changed. Who can refute that? And so you need to be telling people what your testimony is. Messengers of God's love. Let me ask you this. Have you ever wondered why when you were saved, the Lord didn't just take you home to glory? You ever wonder that? Just get you out of this mess. Just get me saved and get me home, Lord. You think about all the heartache in this world. You think about all the brokenness and all the pain. I would rather be in heaven. I would, but, but He leaves us here. But you think about this. In heaven, we can worship in heaven, we can fellowship. In heaven, we can pray. In heaven, we can sing. In heaven, we can hear God's Word. In heaven, we can have joy. We can do all those things in heaven. Why does He leave us here? Well, there's only two things that you can do on earth that you can't do in heaven. One thing you can't do in heaven is you can't sin in heaven. 
Because the Lord says in His Word that no sin will enter into that holy city. There will be nothing that defiles. There will be nothing that tears down. There will be nothing that destroys. It will be pure. That's why we look forward to going to heaven one day. To leave all the sin behind. You can't sin in heaven. You know what else you can't do in heaven? You can't witness in heaven. You can't witness. You know why? Because everybody in heaven already belongs to the Lord. They don't need a witness. The witness is needed here on earth. There's people on earth that don't belong to the Lord. So you can do one of two things on earth. You can sin or you can witness. Now, which one do you think the Lord left you here to do? Who said sin? I'm kidding. No, I, but several people said witness. Witness, that's right. That's why He leaves us here. Because now we have a testimony. Now we've got something to share. Now there's hope. Now there's joy. Now there's a song to sing. Now there's an opportunity to rescue the parachute, to care for the dying. We have a testimony. God wants us to be messengers of His love. People need love today. Before the Lord got a hold of my heart, I needed love. And I'm so thankful that He made a way for me to find His love. And you never know that when you open your mouth to someone and you start telling them your testimony, you start telling them what the Lord means to you, you start telling them how your life has never been the same, you don't know how broken they are, you don't know how needy they are, you don't know how that might change their life forever. James 4.17 says we know to do good. It says, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does it not to him, it is sin. Remember, he leaves us here to do you to do one thing to witness, but you can do the other thing, you can sin. And what he's saying there is if you don't witness, you're sin. You're sin. And so a part of our mission on earth, get this now, is to bring worshipers to Jesus. You know that? Because one day, the Bible clearly teaches us that in Revelation that we'll all stand before His throne. And you know what it says we'll all do? It says we'll all worship. Even those that are lost. Even those that never believed in Jesus on earth. It says every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Whether they believe it or not. One day, that's going to happen. And, and so, if we know to do good, if we know to tell people about Christ on this side of Him, so that they won't be one of those who are non-believers, because then it talks about He's going to separate the sheep from the goat. In other words, the sheep represent those who believed on earth. The goats represent those who never believed on earth. And it says that they're going to be cast away into hell. And all the sheep, all the children that believe is going to be brought into heaven. Entered in, he's going to say to them, enter in, be blessed to the Father. I've often had this picture in my mind that on that day I'm standing there and He separates us out and, and, and He, you know, all you sheep over here and I go over there and I notice somebody that was a friend on earth on the other side. And then mouthing the words to me, why didn't you tell me? He wants us to be witnesses. He wants us to be messengers of His love. How can we afford not to share that message when people are doomed for an eternal hell? When we know to do good and do it not, it's a sin. You know, we're ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Do you know what an ambassador is? It's the representative. Why does He leave us here on earth? Because He makes us His representative. And then He says there in that verse, He says, as if God was pleading through you. That's some power right there. He said, if you will open your mouth and tell people about me, they will sense that it's me pleading through you on their behalf. 
And their hearts will be touched and the conviction will set in. And they may say no, but at least you'll stand before God clean, knowing that you shared your faith with them on that day. And finally, God wants us to be magnifiers of His name. You know, there's an inborn urge in us to worship something. You know that? And if we don't worship God, you know what we'll do? We'll find something to worship. We may worship a sports team. We may worship our fancy car. We may worship the money we make, the, the job that we hold. We may worship some uh, star or some idol. I mean, it's just in us to worship something. And if we don't worship God, trust me, we're worshiping something. There's something at the top of our list. And I would ask you this question. When you think about your priority list of life, what's at the top of your list? Where is God on your list? I mean, think about what do you spend the most time doing? What gets the most of your attention? What gets the most of your money? What gets the most of your time? What is that party list in your life? And, and then where is God on that list? Because really, if you put more focus and time and energy and attention into something uh, above God, then guess what? That's an idol. That's an idol. God should be preeminent in everything. I'm not saying that you, you know, I'm not saying that you got to spend more time with God in prayer than you spend 40 hours a week at work. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that whatever you do, you do it for the glory of God. What are you doing? Are you doing it for God's glory? Or are you doing it for, for your glory? Or are you doing it for somebody else's glory? Why do you do what you do? God needs to be preeminent in your life and that everything you do has that God connection to it. He wants us to be magnifiers of His name. Exodus 20, verses 3 through 5, listen to this. It says, You shall have no other gods before me. Thinking back to that list, what takes all your time, your attention, your money, your talents, what's... What's the most important to you? Thinking of that list, God says this, you shall have no other gods before me. He should be preeminent. And then it goes on to say in verse 4, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. In other words, are you, you know, your God is your sports? Well, that's an image in the earth beneath. Or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. He's jealous for you folks. He's jealous for your life. He's jealous for your heart. He wants you to have no other but Him. That's because He loves you so much. And it says that, that those that, that put other things above Him, that put idols above Him, that put other gods above Him, He says that He's visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate Him. In other words, it's not only about you, it's about those that come after you. Do they see God in you? Or do they see you putting all your time and attention into something worldly, into some kind of idol, and that that curse is handed down to them? Because what are you teaching them? You're teaching them to make those things important. We're talking about being magnifiers of His name. And, and this is worship. This is putting God first. And, and what I want you to understand, we should worship personally. Psalms 103.1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Doesn't need anybody around for that. That's something between you and God. Can you say with everything that's within you, I bless His holy name? That's personal worship. Do you worship the Lord when you're alone? Some people don't know what to do with the Lord when they're alone. Some people have never spent time alone in God's Word or in prayer. They just don't know what to do about that. But he said, let all that's within me bless His holy name. So we should worship on a personal level. We should be comfortable with the Lord. I mean, just spending time with Him. Every day. 
but also we should worship publicly. It was spoken earlier as they did the song, and, and I'll just read Psalm 34 3. It says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And we did some exalting in here today, and it was good. Y'all sounded good. Every week, I want you to come through those doors saying, I'm coming so that we can exalt his name together. Don't ever lose sight of why you're coming through those doors. If you're coming for any other reason, it's the wrong reason. You come through those doors to exalt His name together. He wants us to be magnifiers of His name. Now it's time for our response. And I want to review. God wants you to be a member of this family. God wants you to be a model of His character. In other words, your life should look like Him. God wants you to be a minister of His grace. Find your calling and do it and live in it. Accept it. God wants you to be a messenger of His love. You have a testimony. Share it. And God wants you to be a magnifier of His name. Worship Him. And I'll remind you of this verse that comes up so often in our church here. Christ says in John 15, 5, He says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And then He says, without me, you can do nothing. Nothing. So, I'd ask you this question. Are you abiding in the Lord today? Have you given your heart and your life to Him? Has there ever been a time in your life that you knew that you was a sinner in need of a Savior and you cried out to Jesus in repentance and you said, Lord, forgive me, save me, set me free? 